Hello friends, I've decided to go to Ireland, and here I am. No particular reason for coming to Ireland, it is just a country that I've never been to before and seemed somewhat interesting. I often think of Ireland as like the forgotten fifth beetle of the English-speaking world after Canada, Britain, America, and Australia. As you can tell from all of the urban sprawl behind me, I'm in Dublin right now, the biggest city in Ireland. First, let us do some fast Irish fun facts. Their flag looks like this. They drive on the left. Their symbol is a harp. Their government is engaged in a failed multi-decade project to make people speak Gaelic instead of English, so they plaster it all over public signs. They have green mailboxes. And now let us look at some famous Dublin buildings, because Lord knows there is nothing that is more fun than watching a stranger describe buildings to you. Here's Trinity College, the school of the Irish elite. It also houses the Book of Kells, a very beautiful and well-preserved medieval Bible. The tour was too expensive, so I just looked at it online. Here is the famous Halfpenny Bridge, one of the many bridges that crosses the River Liffey that cuts Dublin in half. And here's the statue of Molly Malone, the main character of a beloved Irish drinking song, who may or may not have been a prostitute. Here's the spire, which they built in 2002 to replace the old spire that the IRA blew up. And here's one of these weird Irish betting houses that they have everywhere. Now, the Irish love two things. This alcoholic toucan, and stories about their long and bloody history of English oppression. And here is a place where you can learn one of those stories, the famous, uh, prison. See, for 800 years, the British occupied Ireland to varying degrees. In 1801, it was formally annexed to the United Kingdom, but a lot of Irish didn't want to be British, so for centuries, they staged various botched revolutions to try to win independence. In 1916, there was a particularly famous and particularly botched attempt at armed revolt called the Easter Rising. A bunch of Irish intellectuals got a bunch of guns and barricaded themselves in places around Dublin. This didn't go well at all, and after a week of fighting, the British rounded up all of the leaders and put them into this prison here. What happened then was the British proceeded to execute all of the revolution leaders, one after another, and outrage over this helped trigger a larger and more serious revolt, which then led to the negotiated independence of Ireland from Great Britain in 1922. Today, the Easter Rising is considered this very sanctified thing, and there are lots of memorials to the leaders, and lots of souvenirs with their manifesto on it, the Proclamation of the Irish Republic. Okay, so now it is the next day, and we are going to Cork, and I will tell you why. See, when I was a little kid, I learned everything about the world from this book here, Richard Scarry's Busy Busy World, and the story about Ireland took place in Cork. See, it was called Patrick Pig Learns to Talk, and it was about a family of Irish pigs, and the little kid Patrick Pig, he wouldn't talk, so they took him to the Blarney Castle where he kissed the Blarney Stone, and then he wouldn't shut up for the rest of the story. See, the legend of the Blarney Stone, which is like one of Ireland's most famous tourist traps, is that if you kiss it, you become a really fine talker. This Cork is a nice city. They say it's a lot more stereotypically Irish than Dublin. Dublin was historically the center of British occupation of Ireland, and that has given the city a much more British feel, they say, than Cork, which they say is the true capital of Irish culture. Okay, so we finally made it to the castle, so we are officially gonna do this now. Childhood closure coming up. Oh man, here it comes. Awesome. I did it. So it is a new day and I am back at the train station. Today we are going to go to Northern Ireland. We are going to go to Belfast. Historically troubled community, but as we can see from the Belfast city guide, they are eager to project a fresh and modern image. So let us see if it is true. Here we are in Belfast, one of Ireland's most historic cities and the center of, what the hell is this? There is no shortage of things to see and do in Belfast. Eat fish and chips, go shopping downtown, withdraw some weird Northern Irish money, go shopping in the mall, see this giant fish, go shopping in the other mall. There really is a surprising lot of shopping here. One thing that I have found difficult though is that these people have the single most impenetrable accents I think I have ever heard in my life. It's like a combination of the thickest Scottish and Irish and English accents all mixed together. I really almost have to like physically strain myself to understand what they are saying to me. So what is Northern Ireland? 
See, when Ireland gained independence from Britain in 1922, Britain hung on to the northern part, which is where all of the people most loyal to England lived. They were mostly direct descendants of English settlers and lived much better than the rest of the island. They were the Irish Protestants, and under British rule, they were given more rights than the Catholic majority. It was considered this big outrage among the Irish independence leaders that these people got to stay part of the UK. Independent Ireland became known as the Republic of Ireland, so people who thought all of Ireland should be united under one independent government were called Republicans. They were mostly Catholic. And the people who wanted to stay in the United Kingdom were known as Unionists. They were mostly Protestant. The Irish War of Independence basically continued in Northern Ireland until the late 1990s in what the Irish now euphemistically call the Troubles. Both Republican and Unionist militias killed a whole bunch of people. But what you most notice when you visit Northern Ireland today is just how deranged fighting for that long has made a lot of people. The residential neighborhoods are still largely segregated along religious and political lines. They even have this giant peace wall separating a large chunk of them from each other. And no matter what neighborhood you're in, you'll always see a ton of these huge hideous murals documenting in loving detail all of the various atrocities the other side has committed against them over the years and all the people they killed and that sort of thing. But there is also a lot of effort to try to stir up a sense of patriotic feeling for one side or the other, and that's the even weirder part. I am staying in a Protestant neighborhood right now, which you can tell because of the flags. It is interesting because I've heard it said that when they were trying to create a sense of like Canadian patriotism in the early 20th century, a lot of it was very heavily based on the sort of patriotic uh, culture of Protestant Northern Ireland. And you really do see a lot of evidence of that when you look at the sort of patriotic uh, decorations that they've got everywhere here. It is obviously very British, but it is a sort of like caricature British, like that the Brits themselves would probably find a little much. So you've got these big Union Jacks everywhere and big tributes to the Queen and the British coat of arms, and a lot of veneration of sacrifices made during the First World War, and Remembrance Day, and the poppy. In the Catholic part, it's mostly just over-the-top Irish patriotism, with a lot of focus on the Easter Rebellion guys. And there's also a lot of weird sucking up to every other freedom fighter slash terrorism type group on Earth, particularly the Palestinians. And by the way, did you know that the Titanic was built in Belfast? Because Belfast wants you to know. You can visit their Titanic Museum, look at their various Titanic memorials, go on a Titanic tour, and of course, buy lots of Titanic souvenirs. And now we're back in Dublin for one more day. And before we end this video, I just wanted to do a brief uh, paw through a couple of the weird Irish things that I have purchased on this trip. See, this thing is a satirical version of this sticker thing that Irish people are forced to put on their cars. See, Irish big government demands that you put various decals on the windshield of your car at all times. And what this is, is a traditional sleeve that people put these discs in, except this one is a sort of satirical one because you know, this side faces outward, and then this side faces the driver, and what it has is sort of some snarky comments for how to deal with a cop when he pulls you over. Weirdly enough, Irish people call uh, cops guards, so that's why it's called, you're looking well, guard. I thought this was just such a bizarrely particular thing that only an Irish person would appreciate that I had to buy it. And then this is a greeting card with a picture of the president of Ireland on it. Michael D. Higgins. He's actually running for re-election right now. The Irish president is just a useless figurehead, although the Irish people seem to take the position relatively seriously. President Higgins is this much beloved sort of cult figure right now. You can get all sorts of weird knickknacks with his face on it, usually somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but also somewhat affectionate. Okay, now this one was a bit of a challenge here. This is a soda called Red Lemonade, made by the TK Corporation. I was looking in my uh, Lonely Planet guide to countries of the world, and they talk about uh, iconic things to eat and drink in every country, and apparently the uh, Red Lemonade is one of the iconic uh, Irish things. But the problem was that it was really, really hard to find. I went all over the place to a whole bunch of different stores, supermarkets, corner stores and whatnot, and I couldn't find it anywhere, which suggests to me that it is perhaps a icon on the decline. But I was able to get it at this one really random, quite small, obscure corner store just around the corner here. And uh, so let me just try a little bit of it and let me tell you what I think. Yeah, it's not really good. It tastes lemony, like 
Sprite or perhaps actually a little bit like soap detergent, but like really, really watered down. I can see why this is uh, not quite so popular anymore. There's this whole spiel on the back about what an amazing Irish product this is. TK Red Lemonade is a true Irish original, like loving the ga hang sandwiches or calling a cupboard a press. The Lonely Planet people tell me that I'm also supposed to try these things here. Kimberly biscuits, supposedly uh, Ireland's most beloved cookie. So let us try one of these. They are these sort of sandwich cream things, sort of soft to the touch. Again, apologies for filming this in the dark, but my Airbnb host is not letting me eat in my uh, room. These are pretty good. They're really spongy and they're sort of like a ginger snap kind of thing. The goo inside is kind of gingery as well. It's covered with little sugar crystals or maybe ginger crystals. I like these, they're not very sweet, but I like ginger and these are very gingery. After the TK soda, you have redeemed yourself, Ireland. Well, that's the end of my trip to Ireland. I hope you enjoyed it. Do not forget to like and subscribe. Next time, we will go to Sweden and I need to shave. <laughs>